Hello learners and welcome to the fifth lecture in the module on Pride and Prejudice. In the previous lecture, I discussed briefly the opening sentences of the novel and I gave a sense of how Jane Austen uses the literary device of irony to describe grave uh, social inequality, uh, specifically the lack of uh, opportunities available to women in uh, 18th and 19th century England uh, with regard to owning property and uh, having financial well-being more generally. This inequality, this problem that existed in the society of her time was described in a way that was very humorous and, and very stylish. There was uh, a sentence in which the readers were jokingly uh, told that when a wealthy man moves into a neighborhood, the families and, and especially the parents of young uh, single women uh, begin to think of that uh, wealthy young man as the property of one of their daughters. This is an instance of uh, uh, irony at work because the reality that the sentence is referring to is the inability of women and especially those single women to own property. Uh, however, it, despite this inequality and in fact because of this inability of, of women to own property, they began to view marriage as the only means of securing a safe and sustainable future and therefore it led to a predatory gaze with which uh, single men with uh, wealth were seen as the property or potentially as the property of uh, these, these families whose daughters might profitably marry this, uh, this uh, single man. Now, uh, let us continue reading uh, these opening sentences and see how from this opening the novel sets up its action, uh, establishes its characters and generally uh, creates an engaging story for the reader. Now, the first sentence which I read out in the previous lecture are uh, spoken or uh, uttered or written by the omniscient narrator. Uh, immediately after this sentence, we hear a character's voice. The narrator has mentioned that people think in a certain way, that uh, for families in these villages, uh, a single man, man with fortune appears to be the potential property of their daughters. Immediately after this, the narrator stops uh, go silent and lets characters speak. The first character says this and, and I'm going to read uh, from Jane Austen's words now. My dear Mr. Bennett said his lady to him one day, have you heard that Netherfield Park is let at last? Mr. Bennett replied that he had not. But it is, returned she, for Mrs. Long has just been here and she told me all about it. Mr. Bennett made no answer. Do not you want to know who has taken it? cried his wife impatiently. You want to tell me and I have no objection to hearing it. This is Mr. Bennet. This was invitation enough, says the narrator. Why, my dear, you must know, Mrs. Long says the netherfield is taken by a young man of large fortune from the north of England. That he came down on Monday in a chaise and four to see the place and was so much delighted with it that he agreed with Mr. Morris immediately that he is to take possession before Michaelmas and some of his servants are to be in the house by the end of next week. What is his name? Bingley. Is he married or single? Oh, single, my dear, to be sure. A single man of large fortune, four or five thousand a year. What a fine thing for our girls. How so? How can it affect them? My dear Mr. Bennet, how can you be so tiresome? You must know that I am thinking of his marrying one of them. Is that his design in settling here? Design? Nonsense. How can you talk so? 
but it is very likely that he may fall in love with one of them and therefore you must visit him as soon as he comes. So you can see how in the first page uh, before the reader has completed reading the first chapter of the novel, the reader gets a sense of the dynamic at stake in this novel. The dynamic may be summarized thus. Uh, there is a character, uh, Mrs. Bennet, who is striving, who is uh, hoping fervently and, and wishing that through a quirk of circumstance, through a series of coincidences or accidents or otherwise a chain of events which is not designed or, or scripted but is uh, but occurs through the natural order of things through some such arrangement this uh, this young and wealthy single man who has arrived uh, in the nearabouts uh, of their town uh, of their place of living uh, falls in love with one of her daughters that is what she wants that is her primary goal and intention uh, as a parent and especially as a mother, she cares deeply for the well-being of her children and especially her daughters. And uh, she's, she's very aware that as uh, women, uh, as, as girls, the only way for them to have a secure future is to marry a man with a great deal of wealth. Uh, she knows these facts and therefore when she hears that uh, wealthy man has uh, is about to move into their neighborhood she fervently hopes that uh, this uh, event can lead to another event which is uh, his falling in love with, with one of her daughters now the interesting thing to note in the scene is that the narrator the the omniscient uh, all-seeing third person narrator uh, whom jane austen deploys to convey this information to readers arranges so that we learn about this desire and this um, uh, somewhat difficult situation in which Mrs. Bennet is from a conversation that she has with Mr. Bennet, her husband. Uh, it is important to note how Mr. Bennet plays ignorant. He pretends to be ignorant, he, he pretends to not understand the source or the reason for his wife's excitement and uh, anxiety and a combination of uh, excitement and anxiety which generally causes her to be in a somewhat agitated state. And uh, he, he does not do this out of, uh, out of uh, sheer lack of understanding or knowledge. Uh, it will become very clear to readers later on that Mr. Bennett is, is very well aware, very shrewd, uh, very sharp, very discerning and uh, uh, he enjoys, uh, he, he derives some pleasure from uh, forcing or from hearing Mrs. Bennett, his wife, clarify the things that uh, she takes for granted and she hopes that others would also take for granted. Uh, what are these things? Uh, what I just explained, uh, how this situation can turn into a, a happy ending, uh, can, can lead to the beginning of a new future for one of her daughters. Now, she, Mrs. Bennet, that is to say, uh, requests and uh, places a, a very strong injunction on Mr. Bennet to go and call on this this gentleman whose name is Mr. Bingley and uh, to ensure that the families begin a correspondence, that they begin a social intercourse, uh, they, they meet for lunch, uh, they, they meet for uh, evenings uh, out, they, they're invited to dances and so on. We are introduced to these characters uh, that is this uh, rich, wealthy young man who has just moved into this uh, country village uh, along with another character in the very next chapter in which there is a ball and uh, a lot of people meet each other. Uh, in this uh, chapter, the, the narrator introduces both this man who, who, 
whose uh, imminent arrival has produced such agitation in, in Mrs. Bingley and another character, uh, Mr. Darcy. Um, I, I want to read uh, the paragraph which introduces uh, Darcy because it says something very crucial about how this novel invites us to view individuals and uh, human beings, uh, what kind of demarcations, social uh, factors, economic factors and generally how this novel identifies human beings as characters. So, at the ball, from the perspective of the reader, uh, for the benefit of, of the reader who is not there, the narrator describes people. Uh, this is what uh, Austin's narrator writes. Mr. Bingley was good looking and gentlemanlike. He had a pleasant countenance and easy, unaffected manners. His sisters were fine women with an air of decided fashion. His brother in law, Mr. Hurst, merely looked the gentleman. But his friend Mr. Darcy soon drew the attention of the room by his fine, tall person, handsome features, noble mien and the report which was in general circulation within five minutes after his entrance of his having 10,000 a year. Now, the structure of this last sentence is crucial to understanding something, uh, a very fundamental truth about the social universe that Jane Austen's novel describes and the, the universe which lays down the rules for interactions within human beings. Uh, the sentence begins by describing qualities of the individual, uh, material qualities of his, uh, of his face, of his shape, of the way he appears and ends by mentioning a number, uh, 10,000 a year. Uh, two numbers, if, you, uh, if, if one is being specific. The, the first number is the, the amount of money that uh, he earns or, or he gets. And the second number is the, the period over which he gets that money. And, and the combined effect of these two numbers is that they situate this individual in the social and economic hierarchy of 18th century England. Right? And uh, the number 10,000 pounds a year places Mr. Darcy at the very top of that hierarchy. Right? Uh, we have just read a passage in which we, we learned that Mr. Bingley, the, the other young man, wealthy, uh, single and wealthy young man who is uh, just moved to this neighborhood uh, has about four to five thousand a year. Okay? So uh, this is uh, even more uh, exciting or, or should be even more exciting and, and should produce even more agitation, uh, anxiety and excitement uh, for someone like Mrs. Bennett who was uh, excited enough, who could barely contain her excitement at knowing that Mr. Bingley has four four or five thousand a year. And so the, the signs all point in one direction that Mr. Darcy's arrival uh, as an invitee, as a friend of Mr. Bingley should produce even more excitement. However, that's not quite what happens. Right? And as the, uh, as the remainder of this paragraph uh, makes it clear, uh, and, and let us read to find out what is the consequence or, or what is the effect of these two kinds of information. On, on one hand, the appearance of uh, Mr. Darcy, which is quite pleasing and generally very agreeable. And um, on the other hand, his, uh, his economic position, which is also very, very intimidating and I'm sure very exciting for potential suitors. The gentleman pronounced him to be a fine figure of a man the ladies declared he was much handsomer than Mr. Bingley and he was looked at with great admiration for about half the evening till his manners gave a disgust which turned the tide of, its, of his popularity. For he was discovered to be proud, to be above his company and above being pleased. And not all his large estate in Derbyshire 
could then save him from having a most forbidding, disagreeable countenance and being unworthy to be compared with his friend. What we see in this passage is uh, a key introduction and the use of a word which gives the novel its title. That word is, is proud uh, and I'm sure uh, attentive readers will have noticed uh, how this word produces a very strange and uh, disconcerting effect on readers who have so far been predisposed to admire and appreciate this character. Okay. So this quality of uh, pride, uh, the inclination that this person has to be proud, this uh, counters all the good work that his appearance and his wealth have done so far in producing a favorable reception for him in this country village. Right? Um, not only is, is he not liked, but he is especially disliked because despite being a, a good friend of, uh, of Mr. Bingley, he has, the exact, he has exactly the opposite characteristics. Uh, and how is uh, Mr. Darcy's pride uh, understood and demonstrated? He seems to be above his company, above being pleased, and not all his large estate in Derbyshire could then save him from having a most forbidding, disagreeable countenance. Right? So, we see something quite contradictory happening here. So far, we have been given to believe that wealth alone determines the, the value, uh, the, the pleasantness and the worth that, that is associated with a man. Right? Uh, so far, we've, we've been given to believe that uh, if a single man is wealthy, then that's all he needs to do to attract uh, a, a legion of uh, single women who will all want to secure his hand in marriage. Uh, here, however, we read something else. We, we find that it is not enough to be wealthy. In fact, uh, even though Mr. Darcy has a greater uh, amount of wealth and his estate in Derbyshire, right, and it's, it's uh, supposedly a very large estate, so far we have not had any direct evidence from the narrator or any of the characters who've visited or seen this estate, but uh, his reputation has traveled with him uh, and from this reputation, uh, rumors and uh, hearsay, the narrator is able to confirm with, uh, with some degree of confidence that he has a large estate which ensures that he has that very large uh, income of 10,000 pounds a year. Uh, despite having this very large income, his uh, personal behavior, his, his attitude and in particular his pride uh, undoes everything that would make him attractive and he's considered uh, disagreeable, forbidding and generally unworthy. Now, immediately after this chapter, we read a chapter in which the daughters of Mrs. Bennet uh, and uh, among these daughters, there are uh, two of them who, who, uh, on whom the, the novel focuses our attention in greater detail. They are Jane and Elizabeth. Elizabeth, as, uh, as we'll soon find out, uh, will be the, the protagonist of the novel. And uh, the narrator will uh, provide Elizabeth with a great deal of authority. The narrator will trust Elizabeth's perspective because Elizabeth's perspective will come closest to describing uh, what is objective and, and what is true. In the chapter immediately after the ball, we witness a conversation between Elizabeth and Jane. And uh, in this conversation, uh, th these two sisters exchange notes on what they had perceived in the character of, of these guests. Uh, who are these guests? Uh, Mr. Bingley, who is about to move into the neighborhood, uh, his friend Mr. Darcy, who's traveled with him, and uh, Mr. Bingley's sisters. Right? 
uh, now at back home from this ball, uh, Elizabeth and Jane are talking and Jane has just made a comment about how Mr. Bingley's sisters are quite agreeable uh, women. And in response, this is what Elizabeth uh, has to say uh, and, and think uh, in the words of Austin's narrator. Elizabeth listened in silence, but was not convinced. Their behavior, that is Mr. Bingley's sisters, their behavior at the assembly had not been calculated to please in general and with more quickness of observation and less pliancy of temper than her sister and with a judgment too unassailed by any attention to herself, she was very little disposed to approve them. They were in fact very fine ladies, not deficient in good humor when they were pleased, nor in the power of being agreeable when where they chose it, but proud and conceited. They were rather handsome. They had been educated in one of the first private seminaries in town, had a fortune of 20,000 pounds, were in the habit of spending more than they ought and of associating with people of rank, and were therefore in every respect entitled to think well of themselves and meanly of others. They were of a respectable family in the north of England. A circumstance more deeply impressed on their memories than that their brother's fortune and their own had been acquired by trade. Right. Uh, this long description of Elizabeth's uh, critical thinking or her ability to weigh uh, a great deal of information, background information, contextual information before reaching a conclusion or before granting her approval to whether or not she admired or liked a certain individual uh, gives us a sense of how the narrator uh, approaches human relationships. Right? The, the novel is written in a time when there was a great deal of emphasis on propriety, uh, on not being kind or being proper, but uh, showing that one was in fact kind. Uh, the novel is written when people set a great deal of uh, emphasis on, on appearances and therefore it becomes even more important for individual observers to, uh, to use the critical faculty of thinking uh, how much one is uh, displaying and, and, and what is truly uh, meaningful or an, or an act of true kindness. Elizabeth is a very discerning uh, observer of uh, human interactions and therefore she, she observes very clearly and she critically analyzes what these Bingley sisters were doing. And her conclusion is that the Bingley sisters had everything in their favor. They occupied a material and social position which made it easy for them to display a certain kind of attitude and behavior towards others. Right? And she calls that uh, pride. Right? She, the, the last sentence of the first half of this paragraph, the, the words proud and conceited are used. Right? And Elizabeth understands, uh, Elizabeth forgives, Elizabeth uh, accepts that for a certain kind of individual born and raised in a certain way, a certain behavior, a certain kind of behavior comes natural. And uh, in the case of the Bingley sisters going to private seminaries, having a fortune of 20,000 pounds, etc. These things uh, necessitated, almost automated uh, a kind of behavior. Right? And so there was nothing to admire, uh, but, but of course there was nothing to, to uh, dislike in, in this behavior either. And so we see how Jane is uh, so much more forgiving and Elizabeth is uh, so much more discerning. Uh, in, in this conversation. The last sentence uh, of the this, this summary of Elizabeth's uh, understanding and uh, consideration is, is important for understanding class in this novel. Now, 
In Elizabeth's view, the, the Bingley sisters came from a respectable family in the north of England. And this was a circumstance more deeply impressed on their memories than that their brother's fortune and their own had been acquired by trade. Right? Uh, what does this sentence mean? It, it's a very subtle indication of how attitudes towards class were changing and how different individuals thought in different ways about class. Right? Now, Elizabeth is uh, very sharp in, in observing that for the Bingley sisters, their present circumstance, right, which is that they were born to a respectable family in the north of England, that is more important or that has come to seem to be more important than another fact, which is that their fortune, uh, that their brother's fortune and their own had been acquired by trade. The word trade here indicates that the wealth that the Bingleys have is uh, new money, right? Uh, it was not inherited through their connection to royalty or by the fact that, it, that they inherited land. Rather, they made their fortune through owning businesses, right? Uh, these are the two kinds of ways in which uh, wealth was generated in Austin's England. And there was a, a very deep seated uh, social condescension towards new money, right? Uh, as we'll soon find out, uh, the difference between Bingley and Darcy is the difference between new and old money. Darcy's 10,000 pounds a year, which uh, we, we've just been, uh, about which we've just been told, comes from land that he has inherited. Uh, they don't have business interests and that money has not come from trade. Right? So, uh, Elizabeth has discerned a certain desire, a certain uh, inclination in the Bingley sisters to think of themselves in a certain way. Elizabeth does not believe that uh, money or wealth acquired from trade is better or worse than wealth acquired uh, through, through inheritance. Rather, Elizabeth has noticed that the Bingley sisters are conscious of a social condescension and they would like to be seen as coming from older money than from newer money. So it is this, uh, this discernment, it is this observation that uh, the Bingley sisters not only have a certain amount of wealth, but would be, but would rather be thought of as having a certain kind of wealth, which uh, disposes Elizabeth to think of them in a, a less than ideal manner. Uh, and, and this is also an indication of uh, how deeply these uh, lines of class division run through Austen's novels and how different characters become real for us uh, readers in the way in which they perceive these, these class divisions. Now, continuing uh, this discussion of uh, very subtle but, but very real and, and very deep class divisions in the novel, we are introduced to another family uh, that, that is that of the Lucases, who are uh, the immediate neighbors of the Bennets. Uh, the, the fourth chapter of the novel begins, uh, within a short walk of Longbourn lived a family with whom the Bennets were particularly intimate. Sir William Lucas had been formerly in trade in Meryton, where he had made a tolerable fortune and risen to the honor of knighthood by an address to the king during his mayoralty. The distinction had perhaps been felt too strongly. It had given him a disgust to his business and to his residence in a small market town. And quitting them both, he had removed with his family to a house about a mile from Meryton, denominated from that period Lucas Lodge, where he could think with pleasure of his own importance and unshackled by business, occupy himself solely in being civil to all the world. For though elated by his rank, it did not render him supercilious, 
On the contrary, he was all attention to everybody. By nature inoffensive, friendly and obliging, his presentation at St. James's had made him courteous. So in this description of, uh, of Mr. Lucas and uh, actually Sir William Lucas to be precise, we understand more clearly what Austen's narrator meant when she described uh, Elizabeth's perception of how the Bingley sisters view their wealth as coming from trade. Uh, Sir William Lucas is an example of a uh, of man who, who has made his uh, fortune from a kind of trade. Right? But uh, after generating a certain kind of income, he decides to to change his, uh, his his occupation and to move away from the associations of trade and to make a certain sacrifice. Uh, w what is that sacrifice? He decides to unshackle himself from business and occupy himself in being civil to all the world. Now, this is the decision that Mr. Bingley and uh, his ancestors have not made. They have decided to continue to make their income and their wealth from trade and to accumulate more and more wealth through trade and by that source of income to consolidate their position in this social universe. Uh, we see a contrast between William Lucas who subscribes to a very old way of thinking uh, in whose view uh, wealth that is produced from trade is not as desirable as wealth that is inherited. Right? And uh, this is the difference between Mr. Lucas uh, and Mr. Bingley. And uh, this is also the, the difference or this, this indicates the sacrifice that Mr. Lucas makes when he decides to uh, hold on to the title of Sir William Lucas, that is after he has been uh, awarded this knighthood uh, by uh, by the king and uh, gives up his uh, uh, financial and, and material interests in trade. Uh, we will continue the discussion of class and in particular focus on this, this uh, household of, of the Lucases and uh, understand how these different understandings of wealth, class have a very uh, fundamental and uh, defining impact on the women in, in these two families and we will continue that discussion in the next lecture.